So our yeah. guest in the first segment is a former U.S. attorney for the Northern District, Bill Powell. Bill, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Great to be back. The pleasure is all ours. I always bring you back for the easy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Bill also brought blueberry muffins, which are in this uh, tin. You made these yourself? Of course. Well, these are, these are amazing. They're blueberry muffins with some cinnamon on top. Uh, Mike Height, you've sampled some. The Admiral has sampled some as well. And, what, what do you got? And Dylan also had yeah. some too. And I think we should repeat what Bill said about Joe Ferretti, the advice of the Ferretti game. He said, come in, do two things talk simple and bring in food. It wasn't to talk simple. <laughs> it wasn't talk simple. <laughs> I thought that, I thought that <laughs> played I thought that played better. <laughs> Bill Bill, what'd he say? He what? said never say never speak ill ill of Italians and bring food. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why you'd want to simplify that, Bill. That, to me, that works perfect well. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, Bill, we brought in. Uh, Bill was a, a, a Trump appointee, President Trump appointed during an administration uh, U.S. attorney. And we've gotten to him before uh, with uh, some questions about these indictments and the legality and such. Because if you've seen it in our comments section, you see it across America. People are very divided as to the validity of these indictments and such. I'm not here to ask Bill about the political motivations or, or lack of motivation behind these, depending on your point of view. I want to know specifically on the legal aspects of this, uh, barring upon Bill's expertise there. So first of all, Bill, these four indictments that uh, were just recently read this past week, your thought on the legality of them and the grounds for them? Well, it'll be one indictment, four charges within that indictment. Um, I'll just say at the, at the outset, this particular indictment is way more complicated and, quite frankly, I think way more difficult to prove than the Mar-a-Lago uh, indictment that we talked about last time I was on the show mm -hmm. when, that, when that first came out. That was a much more straightforward um, legally and factually um, indi indictment than this, than this particular one is. Um, there's just one, in this case, there's, there's one defendant, Donald Trump, that's the defendant, no other defendants, but there are un, unnamed co-conspirators in them, six of, six of them, I believe. And I think there's mm -hmm. been lots of speculation as to who the six are. I think I've pretty well narrowed it down who they are, but um, uh, that that will come out at some point. Um, it's it's generally speaking a conspiracy um, indictment. Conspiracies, I mean, I've charged conspiracy cases hundreds of times. It's generally two people deciding to commit a crime. Um, <laughs> but what a conspiracy needs is you know, you and I could decide we're going to rob a bank, but until we take some action to actually rob the bank, that is, we get a gun or we, you know, we, we case the joint, or whatever the case may be, you have to do something in furtherance of a crime in order to have a real conspiracy. Not a crime to talk about committing a crime. Correct. So you and I can agree to do something, but unless we take actions towards doing it, then that's, uh, it's not a crime. So these are a conspiracy. They, the, the, the primary observation I took from reading the indictment, and I've read it a couple of times, and read as much background as I can on these various provisions, is that this is an intent case. Um, what did, if, if they can't prove Donald Trump lied and he knew he was lying, they will lose. This case will not, this, he will, the, the prosecution will not win this case. So um, the, fact, the fact that he said a lie, no, no, no problem. Quite frankly, you can't be charged criminally for, you know, God forbid we would ever criminalize politicians telling lies. Mm -hmm. um, but telling a lie um, is way different than knowing you're telling a lie to the in violation of a particular provision. So um, there's a difference. And the, the indictment makes pretty clear early on. It, it, I think in the first several paragraphs talk about the fact that he has certain free speech rights. He can go out and say things about the election and what he thought of the election and what he what he thought was wrong with the election all fair game not a crime so i think they recognized the prosecutors in that who written, wrote this indictment recognized early on that that's a hurdle that they have to overcome and they wanted to get it out of the way very good uh in regards to um the federal prosecutor bringing the charges here uh, i think the success rate of federal prosecutors who bring charges is extremely high they tend to not bring these indictments forward unless they have a very strong case that they're fairly certain that they will win. Yet you say this may be a very difficult case to win, Bill, and it rests in proving that President Trump knew 
he was telling a lie as he did or did not put actions forth that ultimately resulted in January the 6th right. and, and such. So who among the, the five or six, who has the key testimony on this? Because I keep hearing Mike Pence's name being brought as a person who has the, perhaps the most uh, damning testimony in this situation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Mike Pence is certainly going to be a witness um, because certainly one of the, the criminal acts that were um, formed the basis for the indictment is the pressuring of Mike Pence by President Trump at the time to vote differently or take some action during the certification process. The, prob the problem is this. There is going to be a, um, a wide swath of conduct that's perfectly legal, not criminal. The fact that the president calls somebody to jawbone them to convince them to do something in his, you know, to, in favor of him or in favor of some policy or whatever the case may be, that's done all the time. I mean, politicians call, I don't know if Mike Hyde ever does this, but politicians call people all the time to say, hey, I need you to vote on this way. I need you to vote that way. This is really important. Um, presidents have gone on saying, I'm not even sure this is constitutional, but we need to get this vote vote down and, and do this. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he's pressuring people, even when it comes to, you know, legislators or the vice president in this case, in and of itself is not, doesn't get you there um, in this case. He has to do something more than that. Um, for instance, there is an allegation here to some extent in the Georgia uh, situation that he not only the the suggestion in the indictment is and again the indictment just everybody understands is these are charges these are this is not evidence but the allegation is that um during the pressuring of georgia officials he threatened prosecution of those people if they didn't you know follow through well mm -hmm. now you're crossing you're kind of crossing the rubicon it, it becomes something different um the whole slate of electors thing the scheme the the alleged scheme where he was he and along with uh, one of his alleged co-conspirators called these various places, Arizona and amongst others, saying, we need a new elector slate, okay? We're going to forget the old ones. We're going to get the new ones. Well, depending on who you believe uh, or how you interpret it, um, the elector scheme was being set up because if we win these civil cases, we're going to need these new electors to come in and, to D.C. and to do, their, to do their duty if we win the civil action, which is perfectly legal. If that's if that's if that's what they were actually doing in the intent of that particular request. Now, if they were saying, no, I know this is this is totally bogus and we're going to set these people up and we're going to have them do this, then it becomes something entirely different. So you have to prove that Donald Trump knew that the whole thing was bogus and he was doing it intentionally, knowing it was false, and nevertheless tried to do it. And before I go to Bill next, uh, quickly in regards to a change of venue, uh, the attorneys for Trump <laughs> mentioned West Virginia as a change of venue. <laughs> Ultimately, what would it take to change the venue from Washington, D.C. to anywhere else, up in West Virginia or wherever? Yeah, it's a, generally speaking, change of venue is not going to be granted when you say, um, I don't like the way these people voted in this district. Okay, That's what it would be, <laughs> essentially what it is, because D.C. is not nearly as obviously favorable to former President Trump than West Virginia is. So that in and of itself is, is, is not going to get you there. Um, the question is going to be whether you can seek people who are going to get the, quite, the, the typical of voir dire questions, that is, setting aside your, your interests or your, your voting record, can you fairly um, look at the evidence and make a, make a decision based on the evidence alone? And if you get 12 people who are going to say yes without any other problems, then you're going to be able to seat a jury. I mean, we've seen, we've seated juries all over this country in various districts for very high profile cases, OJ, and, you know, all, just name the cases we can, we can find them and people have opinions. But, um, so I, I find that they're going to make the motion. They're going to try to get out of DC. There's no question about that. Well, coming to West Virginia, I guess the hotel industry would really be excited about that because they'd be booked for like five months. Benefits, parks and rec, baby. Well, parks and rec <laughs> and restaurants and everything else. So they'd be lobbying to get that, that case here. But, um, it's going to have, I mean, they're going to make the motion, but I find it um, improbable that it's going to be granted. Billy. Bill, from your time with DOJ, did you work with Jack Smith or did you know of him? I knew of him. I've met him. Um, okay. um, you know, he's a, 
Um, he's not a woke liberal by any st- stretch of the imagination. He's a pretty conservative guy, I think, um, in the big scheme of things politically. Um, he's a, he's, his reputation is a pretty aggressive prosecutor. Um, well, they've put a lot on his plate. Oh, yeah. no question. Uh, do you have? Do you anticipate he's up to the task? I don't. All her, all from all accounts, he's a really good prosecutor yeah. and a very smart guy. And I, I'm expecting he has a team of a hundred. So yeah. I think he's probably <laughs> pretty, pretty good, he's yeah. probably going to have a lot of stuff. To Which do. kind of brings us back to a point that you mentioned a second ago, and uh, I found have found to be curious. There's one defendant at this point in time, and six co-conspirators. Mm-hmm. What is the legal? Or the strategic uh, reason for taking this approach? A couple. Number one, you, the trial will be conceivably shorter, um, conceivably faster, because when you have multiple defendants, in a, particularly in a conspiracy case, there are all kinds of cross motions about, I want to be severed, I don't want to be severed, I want to be joined, I don't want to be joined, and it becomes very more, much more complicated legal issue um, in those scenarios. Plus, if I'm the prosecutor, I would always rather deal with one lawyer as opposed to five lawyers. I mean, why am I going to just get piled on all the time? Third, um, he has leverage. The prosecutor has leverage. Um, he wants, he's going to have them testify. He can still prosecute those people. And uh, so that, those, that, that's always going to be hanging over their heads. So taken from the flip side, taken from the defensive, defense uh, side, would you be more, more nervous knowing you're the single defendant as opposed to going in front of the bench with uh, four or five colleagues? Um, I guess it depends what, the, what I think the witnesses are going to say. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, if I got five guys that are all going to go to bat for me, let's just say, let's just pick one, Rudy Giuliani, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, he gets up on the stand and says, no, pre- I told President Trump these legal things. This is my legal opinion. I gave him this legal advice. This is what he believed. And therefore, he didn't believe he was lying. He didn't believe what he was saying was bogus or false. That's pretty strong testimony for President Trump. Uh, now, the problem that they're going to run into is that lawyers are going to be advising Giuliani Sidney Powell, who, by the way, just make this clear on the record, she has no relation to me whatsoever. <laughs> Never. I, I have no family ties to her, uh, legally or otherwise. Mike, um, look out in the parking lot. See who's waiting in Bill's car for him out there. Um, so the, uh, the problem that, that those people are going to have is they, if they get on the stand, if I'm their lawyer, what I'm telling them is, yeah, you're not talking about anything. You're taking the Fifth Amendment and you're walking out. Okay? Now... Really, Giuliani gets on the stand and says, I'm taking the Fifth Amendment. That's not helpful to Donald Trump. Yeah. It's just not because that's his advisor. And if he's taking the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination, regardless of what the jury instruction says, you're not to take anything from that. You're not to believe, you know, believe them any less, blah, blah, blah. It has an impact. But even though the six have, are not, have not been charged and may not be charged, you do expect all six to be on the witness stand. Oh yeah, I expect okay. they'll be they'll be identified as witnesses for one or both sides. Mm-hmm. Mike Height. So these indictments, th- this most recent indictment, um, seems like it's a whole lot harder to prove than the other ones. That be, because, like you said, there is intent. So I'm wondering why they would bring these in, these particular indictments um, at at this time. And I've also heard that that these all could take a long time, way past the time of the election and if he is elected if donald trump is elected president how many of these would just go away because he's now president yeah it's it that's an interesting question i'm not sure what the answer to that question is i think it's important to point out and people don't recognize this you know um we're talking about smith who's the um uh, special prosecutor in this case he's not independent counsel so he reports to the attorney general I mean, this is not an independent counsel thing like we had in Watergate or something like that, where they have they're basically on their own. They don't report to an attorney general. Um, so yeah, that has it has a significant impact. I will say this particular case, notwithstanding the complications, um, is much more likely to be char- tried before the election than the other one, uh, for lots of reasons. But um, how that will all play out, I'm not exactly sure. I will say that. The law supports this particular indictment. I mean, the problem is that some of the law that defines the various very important legal terms like corruptly, which is in the statute that was charged, 
looking at like from 1970s Supreme Court decisions. The current Supreme Court has not really ruled on this kind of stuff for a long time. And the D.C. Circuit Court is actually has these these issues associated with some of these these charges were used in the um, charging the rioters at the, the Capitol. Um, and the D.C. Circuit Court is actually considering some of these legal issues now. So that will also all play into how this case proceeds. But pick up on Mike's point, uh, there are four indictments that have been provided. Only two of those are federal. The other two are state. Is that correct? The Georgia and New York okay. are state. So, correct. So the election would not have anything to do with a Georgia and New York indictment. Correct. Okay. These um, conspiracy charges, uh, I would think these are very, very hard to 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 prove. Um, that if, if anybody's ever been in a boardroom and you, and you have the chairman of the board say, I want to do this or I'll make a motion or something. And then, and then you have the whole group or several in the group say point of order. We can't do it that way. And that seems to me like this is what happened. Trump went on a rant. He starts yelling at everybody. And, and you have a lot of people are saying, no, we can't do things that way. And, and then he comes back and says, well, how can we do it? Let's, let's find a way to do it. You know? So I wonder how much of this is just him ranting, and now we're trying to prosecute him because of all of his rants, um, and, and how much of it is actual provable that he tried to actually commit crimes. Just, what do you think that was the very first question that Jack Smith would ask himself? Well, I, you, you have to ask yourself how much of this is political. Well, well let me just say this with respect to that. Um, conspiracy part is easy. Getting to getting to prove two people are working together is pretty straightforward. I mean, Giuliani and the rest of them were in; uh, they were in constant presence of President Trump and giving him all kinds of advice. Obviously, um, the testimony is going to be fairly straightforward. I mean, I, unfortunately, I was part of this process towards the end in the sense that, you know, post election, we were set. We were, you know, we were tested. Did you, did you see any fraud? Did you what? What was the, you know? Do whatever you need to do to figure out if there was any kind of widespread fraud. And I know Bill Barr, among others, he was in a room with Giuliani and, you know, Sidney Powell and the others and, and then the White House counsel. So you have about, you know, half a dozen lawyers on one side, half a dozen lawyers on the other side. Barr and the rest of them are saying, these people are crazy. If you're listening to them, <laughs> you're, you're crazier than we think. Mm -hmm. That's what they were telling them. And, and I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially the message that was, was being given. I mean, Sidney Powell is kind of, She's out there. I mean, mm -hmm. she's doing stuff that um, you have real questions about. I think that proved out later. But be that as it may, um, so he's got all these teams of people, including White House counsel and you know the Attorney General and others, saying, telling him, blah blah blah. This is there's no there's no widespread fraud. You are this is a the dangerous path. And then you got these other lawyers just saying, oh no, we think this is this is this is a good. You got a chance here. Blah blah blah. So question is, he picked he picked the wrong people to listen to in the big scheme of things according to the to the indictment and that's going to be the question but my question is how much of that is criminal if he's getting bad advice from his lawyers and they're saying one thing and telling him and he's saying all right we need to you know but he's getting it's not a he's not a, it's it doesn't seem to me like it's a conspiracy or he's trying to commit a crime he's taking the advice of lawyers that advice that he likes uh, agreed but he's acting upon that advice. So how much of that is criminal if, if he's getting advice from his lawyers to do certain things? Well, that's the crux of the question, because the, the, the question is going to be, what do you really believe? Now, there are tidbits in the indictment, if you go through it, that talks a little bit about, for instance, what we believe to be Sidney Powell, the, un, the unindicted co-conspirator, that at one point she's saying about these voting machines, and his comment was, well, that's crazy, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, there's another one that he talks about, well, we can't do this. That's a problem for the next guy, meaning that he – suggesting that he knew that he had lost the election, okay? So there are tidbits here and there in the indictment that you see – that they're going to use to suggest that he knew the jig is up and he knew he had lost, that he, he knew these, these contests or these, these arguments being made were uh, basically, you know – blatant attempts to try to derail to derail the election. So there's the criminality, Mike. Mm -hmm. If if in fact he believed he knew that he had lost, but he's still doing this stuff on the side to try to disrupt the situation, that's the criminality. Now if he really believed he won, because these lawyers saying, No, that's what they're telling me. I believe everything they said, then yeah, that's 
that's a that's a losing case for the prosecution. And I'm assuming this is going to be a jury trial, so you have to convince 12 jurors. That, well, I mean, this is a unanimous decision. You have to be able to convince 12 jurors that, without a doubt, he was doing something criminal. Beyond a reasonable doubt, yes. Okay. Hey, uh, Joe Ferretti texted me a question for you, Bill. He said, interested in your thoughts on the strategy of the unindicted co-conspirators. Uh, conspirators. Also, in interviews last night, Trump's lawyers admitted that Trump asked Pence to reject electors from seven states that they just wanted a delay. That allegation is in the charging document and is a crime. John Eastman referred to it allegedly as a minor violation of the Electoral Count Act. Admitting crimes is a hell of a defense. That was a Mr. Ferretti statement for you. Your response. Yeah, I mean, with respect to the first part, the defense of the unindicted co-conspirators, co co I think I, I touched on that earlier, and that is that if I'm their lawyer, I'm telling them, you're not talking to anybody and without me being there, and I want immunity and or I'm taking my Fifth Amendment if I'm not getting it. Um, the, I mean, the government can't force them to testify. Now, I will say this. I don't know what they testified about earlier. I don't know what the grand jury was. If, in fact, they appeared before the grand jury already and testified, then they probably waived their Fifth Amendment rights and they have no problem. I don't know whether they've testified in congressional committee, behind closed doors, or whatever the case may be. So you can waive those rights, but assuming that you haven't, um, they're not getting within 100 miles of that witness stand if I'm their lawyer. Um, but, you know, they may have enough loyalty, and, you know, clients don't always listen to lawyers, obviously, and they can say, no, I'm testifying, I'm supporting former President well, Trump. You, you say that's bad if, if they come in and they plead the fifth, that you say that's bad for Donald Trump. And, and I'm not sure I agree with that, that if they come in and plead the fifth and then Donald comes in and says, I was just listening to them, you know, unless that, you, there's the, the, the reasonable doubt. Maybe. Uh, or you, unless you believe they're actually co-conspirators. And then if, if they are, why, why is he pleading the fifth? That comes back to the question, Mike, when someone uh, pleads a fifth, especially in front of a jury trial, mm -hmm. what influence, what impact does that have? We all tend to think if they plead the fifth, they're they, guilty. Have, they have something they're hiding. Yeah. Yep, right. Yeah. I would and agree. That's, that's contrary to the law. You get yeah. really sure. strong yeah. instructions yeah. on that. Yeah. But, you know, the practical, the real, in the real world, practical speaking, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I, as a prosecutor, I'd love somebody to get up on the stand and say they're claiming their Fifth Amendment rights. Didn't candidate Trump criticize... Hillary Clinton in the uh, run-up to the 2016 campaign regarding taking the fifth? Yeah, yes. If I remember that correctly, then if you're not guilty, why wouldn't you answer the question? Uh, Am I imagine that? Agree. that I think that happened. And, and bringing up Hillary Clinton, I remember when Comey says nobody in their right mind would bring this case against Hillary Clinton. And I just see this, this, this recent indictment seems like the same thing. Nobody in their right mind would bring this. There just doesn't seem enough evidence. It seems too hard to prove. He's already got three other indictments on. Just let's run the, the course of those. This one just seems like a reach to me. It's a tough indictment. It's going to be a difficult one to prove, but I think legally sound in the sense that it's supported by the law. Now, whether or not the evidence they have, and quite frankly, let's be honest, all the evidence they have is not in this indictment. There's other evidence um, out there. You never put everything you have in the indictment for lots of reasons. Um, but it'd be tough to prove. This kind of circles back to the question I asked earlier about Jack Smith. Uh, all of us non, non lawyers, the layman impression is it's going to be tough, tough to prove. Therefore, he'll probably be, he'll probably not to be uh, prosecuted I mean, or indicted on that. However, I cannot imagine someone with Jack Smith's intelligent credentials uh, not taking this on unless he feels he's on extremely firm legal grounds. On that note, Bill Powell, thank you so much. Appreciate you being here. And for the baked goods, too, which you baked yourself. Always a pleasure. We need to have Bill back at least once a week <laughs> if he's going to continue to bake things for us. I yeah. agree. Yeah. <laughs>